everyone welcome back to a new post today and let's continue with the september current affairs for the upcoming upsc uh, preliminary examination of 2024 so uh, let's begin from where we stopped and the first issue is about the statehood of jammu and kashmir so we know that the state of jammu and kashmir had a special status under article 370 of the indian constitution and now it has been removed so do we have any states previously that were changed to union territories the answer is no but we did have union territories who were changed who were given the status of a state and that was done from uh, under articles uh, 2 3 and 4 of the indian constitution article 1 defines the territory and the name of india in the indian constitution so let me tell you that uh, when uh, after the aftermath of independence that is 1947 we had part a b c d states the part c were the states of the were the provinces of the chief commissioner and part d was andaman and nicobar island but was governed by a lieutenant governor the part c and d Uh, territories became union territories under the uh, control of the center and with the exception of puducherry delhi and jammu and kashmir these have state legislative assemblies which have a chief minister and a council of ministers which are representative bodies so let's take a quick review of about this and after the government of india uh, repealed the special status of jammu and kashmir through under article 370 uh, of the indian constitution in 2019 parliament passed the jammu and kashmir reorganization act which included provisions to cre- create to 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 divide the sta- to dissolve the status of a state uh, of jammu and kashmir and to divide it to reorganize it i'm sorry into two union territories that is jammu and kashmir in the west and ladakh in the east from october 2019 now let me tell you after the indo pak war of 19 47 the princely state of jammu and kashmir was divided between india which is called as the region of jammu and kashmir valley and ladakh and pakistan which is called as the gilgit baltistan and the azad kashmir or the pakistan occupied kashmir maharaja hari singh signed the instrument of accession on 26th october 1947 uh, after an invasion by the pakistani tribesmen sheikh abdullah was appointed as a prime minister of jammu and kashmir uh, as a part of the interim government by maharaja hari singh in March 1948 in order to integrate the provisions of the instrument of accession relating to the powers of the state and indian government the constituent assembly of india drew up a draft provision under the article named as 306a which later became the article 370 so this is the origin of article 370 the constituent assembly of jammu and kashmir was convened to frame a constitution for the new state of jammu and kashmir in october 1951 after an election in which all the seats were won by jammu and kashmir a national conference party abdullah ba of abdullah abdullah has reached an agreement called as the delhi agreement with jawahar lal nehru the then prime minister of india on 24th of july 1952 now it extended the provision so what did this delhi agreement actually do it extended the provisions of the constitution of india regarding citizenship fundamental rights to the state of jammu and kashmir in addition to the jurisdiction of the supreme court of india agreements were also reached on issues such as abolition of monarchy as well as the state being allowed a separate flag and also an official language as well now the delhi agreement spelled out the relationship between the central government and the state through recognizing autonomy of jammu and kashmir while also declaring it as an integral part of india and granting the central government control over se- uh, several subjects that were not part of the instrument of accession in august 2029 both houses of the parliament passed a resolution to amend article 370 and extend the constitution of india to the end in its entirety to the whole state of jammu and kashmir which was then implemented as a constitutional order by the president of india at the same time the parliament also passed the jammu and kashmir reorganization act of 2019 which contained provisions which dissolved the status of a state of jammu and kashmir and established two union territories of jammu and kashmir and that of ladakh So as I told you that we had Part C and D states. Now these uh, were uh, were uh, were t- taken into the federal structure of India. The Part C states were the chief commissioners' provinces. Uh, some of the princely states, each governed by a chief uh, commissioner appointed by the president of India. The then uh, Part C states were ten in number and include Ajmer, Bhopal, Bilaspur, Kur, Delhi, Himachal Pradesh. Kutch, Manipur, Tripura, Vindhya Pradesh. Some of them were merged into the uh, states, and some of them became union territories. One part D state was the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, which was administered by the Lieutenant Governor appointed by the Central Governor. It is helpful if you remember 
these territories alphabetically. After the State Reorganization Act of 1956, the Part C and the Part D were combined into a single territory, into a single category of the Union Territory and due to various reorganizations, we had only six Union Territories at, after the Reorganization Act of 1956 and there were Andaman and Nicobar Islands, Delhi, Himachal Pradesh, Lakkadiv, Minikoy and Amandivi and which was later named as uh, Lakshadweep, Manipur and Tripura. By early 1970s, the Union Territories which got the status of a state are Manipur, Tripura and Himachal Pradesh. They became full-fledged states and Chandigarh became a Union Territory. Another three that is Dadar, Nagar, Aveli, Daman and Diyu and Puducherry now were formed from acquired territories especially from the non-British non colonial powers like the Portuguese and also the French respectively. The parliament, so the three union territories, uh, Dadar, Nagar, Aveli, Damandiu, which have been merged now, and Puducherry were non British territories and they've uh, attained the status of union territories. The parliament of India passed a new law to amend the constitution and provide a legislature for with the elected members along with the chief minister for the union territory. And this is done for Delhi, Jammu and Kashmir, and Puducherry. Generally, the president of India appoints an administrator or a lieutenant governor for each of the UT. Delhi, Puducherry, and Jammu and Kashmir operate differently. Apart from the other five, they were given partial statehood and Delhi was redefined as a National Capital Territory or NCT and incorporated into a larger area known as the National Capital Region or NCR and Delhi, Puducherry and Jammu and Kashmir have an elected legislative assembly and an executive council of ministers which function partially in a state-like manner. So this is about the Union Territories, which of the Union Territories attain statehood and Jammu and Kashmir is the first exception of a state being changed into a Union Territory. And let's look at the, now, the most important issue and the, the related laws with this and this is about child marriage. Now Assam is against child marriage. The state government wants to make a child end ch uh, child marriage in the state by 2026. And the National Family Health Survey reports that 31.8% of the women of Assam were married off before the age of 18. The government has made errors and allocated funds to prevent child marriage and is also con considering of uh, banning polygamy. The statewide drive against child marriage was done under the laws such as the Prohibition of Child Marriage Act 2006, which defines the marriageable age for girls and boys as 18 and 20 and the Protection of Children from Sexual Offences Act of 2011. Those who are married, those uh, girls, those uh, who marry girls uh, in the age group of 14 to 18 are booked under the Prevention of Child Marriage Act and those who marry girls below the age of 14 are booked under the Protection of Children from the Sexual Offences Act of 2011. Now, child marriage refers to a marriage of a child below the age of 18 years in accordance with the Article 1 of the Convention of the Right of Child and also in India as well. What are the legislations with regard to child marriage? So we have a Child Marriage Restraint Act of 1929, which is also called as the Sardha Act and extended to the whole of India at that period of time with the exception of Jammu and Kashmir and, uh, and Hyderabad. This act defined the marriageable age for children as 18 for males and 14 for females. The Preconception and Prenatal Diagnostic Techniques Act of 1994 and the Prohibition of Child Marriage Act of 2006. Recently, there was a bill brought about to amend the Prohibition of Child Marriage Act. It is called as the Amendment Bill of 2021. Now, the purpose of this bill is to equalize the age of marriage for women on par with men, raising it to 21 years from the present 18 years. We also have a United Nations Convention on the Rights of Child of 19 1989 which stands against child marriage. So this is about child marriage. The next most important issue is with regard to registration of periodicals. So we have the new Press Registration of Books Act and the Press Registration of Periodicals Bill 2023 was introduced in the Rajya Sabha and it repeals the Press Registration Books Act of 1867. The Act provides for the registration of newspapers, periodicals and books. It also provides for cataloging of books. The bill provides for registration of periodicals. Periodicals do not include books of scientific or academic journals. Now, the foreign periodicals also may be get registered with India with the prior approval of the central government and the bill provides for the press registrar general of India to issue a certification for registration for all the periodicals in India. 
and the Chandrayaan-3 rover found that plasma is passed on the moon and this will be very very effective for communications especially during the lunar missions and let, uh, let's take a look about this so now one more mission instrument on board the, uh, the Pragyan rover confirmed the presence of sulfur on the moon and another instrument called as a Langmuir probe uh, on the Vikram lander revealed the densely uh, density of the plasma near the lunar surface is very very thin now the Langmuir probe is named after the inventor or American physicist is Irving Langmuir and it is an instrument that measures the properties of plasma plasma uh, what the plasma which we are talking about is not a, the not the blood plasma but it is the soup of positively charged ions and negatively charged electrons now the Langmuir probe of the victim La Vikram lander which the ISRO rechristened as a rumba LP also known as the radio and uh, anatomy of moon bound hypersensitive ionosphere and atmosphere has checked out that plasma in the region near the moon surface is very less and this will be very very helpful for lunar communication this means that there are not not many electrons in the region of space this is what the ISRO says and the thinness of the plasma is important because it will affect the way the radio waves propagate to, through space which is important for telecommunication and radio waves get affected by the presence of plasma the denser the plasma the more the radio waves will be scattered scattered I'm sorry and this will affect communication the sparseness of the plasma means the radio waves can propagate through space with less attenuation which is important for telecommunications communicate uh, for uh, communications during the lunar missions this is what is said and the next most important issue is regard the Nobel Prize of Asia also called as the Raman Megasese award so recently the surgical oncologist known uh, with name of Ravi Kannan he is the director of the Kachar uh, Cancer Hospital and Research Center in Assam and he has received this prestigious Raman Megasese award of 2023 he won the award for re revolutionizing the treatment of cancer in Assam through his people-centered and pro programs now let us look at some of the key facts of this award established in 1957 it is Asia's highest honor and premier prize and it celebrates the individuals who demonstrate a spirit of serving the people of Asia regardless of the background the award is present annually on august 31st which coincides with the birthday of raman megasese the third president of the Rep republic of philippines who also inspired the creation of philippines the country awardees are presented a certificate of medallion and an embossed image of raman megasese the award is internationally recognized as a no nobel prize of asia counterpart and recognition of the categories the award initially featured six categories including the government service public service community leadership journalism literature creative communication arts peace and international understanding eminent eminent uh, emergent leadership I'm sorry however post 2009 the award is no longer being given in a fixed award category except for emergent leadership and the most important issue with regard to corruption index uh, I'm sorry corruption reports in India is an organization called as the organized crime and corruption reporting project now this reporting project is a global network of investigative journalists and with staff in six continents and it was founded in 2006 and specializes in organized crime and also corruption so this is an organization which investigates organized crime and corruption and it provides re reports regarding organized crime and corruption with regard to India as well and the next most important issue is with regard to the conflict between the Southeast Asian countries and China on the change of China's map even India also uh, gave away its criticisms with regard to this because China included the Aksai Chin and Arunachal Pradesh in the map claiming that these are its territories so China has brought about a change recently in the map which includes the territories of Anachal Pradesh and Aksai Chin and also territories of disputed islands with regard to the South China Sea bordering Philippines Vietnam and Thailand in its map now the territorial disputes in South China Sea involve conflicting island and maritime claims in the region by several sovereign nations namely the People's Republic of China Taiwan that is the Republic of China Brunei Malaysia Philippines Vietnam the disputed islands involve the islands reefs banks and other features of of the South China Sea including the Spratly Islands, Perasil Islands, the Scarborough Shoal and also the boundaries of the Gulf, Gulf of Tonkin. 
it's important for you to remember the names of these islands and also identify them on the map along with Gulf of Tonkin as well. The waters near the Indonesian Natuna Islands, which some regarded as the geographically, geographically as a part of South China Sea, are disputed as well. Now, maritime disputes also extend beyond the South China Sea into the East China Sea with regard to the Senkaku Islands and the Socotra Rock as well. Let us look at some of the islands which are in dispute. So, there is a nine dash line that is claimed by the Republic of China and which covers most of the South China Sea and overlaps with the exclusive economic zone. So this nine dash line, which is claimed by China, overlaps with the exclusive economic zone of Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, which is protected by the 1982 United Nations Conventions on the Law of Sea. Maritime boundary along Vietnam's coast, Taiwan and, uh, uh, and Malaysia, uh, Taiwan and Vietnam as well. Maritime boundary north of Borneo uh, between the BRC, Malaysia, Brunei, Philippines, Taiwan and the island reefs and the banks of the shoals of South China Sea including the Parasil, Spratly, Pratas, uh, Virikir uh, uh, banks, the Macclesfield Bank, the Scarborough Shoal and the Spratly Islands between PRC, Taiwan and Vietnam and also the parts of the area which are contested by Malaysia and Philippines as well. The maritime boundary in the waters of the north of the Natuna Islands between PRC, Indonesia, Taiwan and Vietnam as well and the maritime boundary of the coast of Palawan, Luzon between PRC and the Philippines and Taiwan. Maritime boundary between the islands of Sabah including Ambalat between Indonesia, Malaysia and Philippines and the maritime boundary and islands of the Luzon Strait between PRC that is China, Philippines and Taiwan. So these are the disputes involved between China and the various countries and the disputed islands or the strait or the coastline as well. So Ernie was in news recently, E-R-N-I-E, it is an AI chat box. Now there's a lot of publicity on the uh, generative AI chatbot innovations all across North America. That is OpenAI's ChatGPT, uh, Google's BARD and most uh, recently Amazon Q are all most competitive generative AI chatbots and we cannot forget Meta AI's chatbot as well which uh, has a partnership with Microsoft's Bing playing both sides of OpenAI and Meta and also a smart chess move by Microsoft I would say. So the Ernie chatbox is based on Baidu's intentionally developed large language model which uses enhanced representation through knowledge integration. It is like any other chatbox and can generate text images videos etc and operates mainly in Mandarin Chinese but it can also handle English to a lesser extent as well and the, and the third most last one for the day is about government appointing a committee to study about simultaneous elections so one nation one election has been the call of the BJP governments uh, uh, especially Prime Minister Narendra Modi and a committee has been formed to look into the possibility of one nation one election under the simultaneous elections which will be held for Lok Sabha and the state assemblies the the present committee was headed by, is headed by the former president of India Ramnath Kovin and this is the fourth in line to examine the possibility of simultaneous elections. Earlier the prospect was studied by the Law Commission, Niti Aayog and the Parliamentary Standing Committee as well. And the idea of simultaneous elections is not new because the first few general elections included the simultaneous elections with state in the post-independent uh, period until 1967 where certain state assemblies, especially Kerala, got dissolved in 1968 and 69 and the system of simultaneous elections to both the centre, that is the Lok Sabha and the state legislative assemblies was in disrupted. In order to conduct, uh, conduct now the simultaneous elections, there is a need to amend laws. They are the Representation of People Act 1951, the rules of procedure of the Lok Sabha and the state legis uh, legislative assembly as well as the constitution as well. And this has to be, there needs to be a special uh, amendment of the constitution which requires a ratification of the half of the states. However, the Law Commission in 1999, uh, Justice B. B, uh, B. P. G. Van Reddy in the 170th Reform Report of Electoral Laws cautioned that such a change cannot be held overnight. Let's see what are the, some, of the, uh, some of the challenges with regard to simultaneous elections. So, this was given by our very own Law Minister, then uh, Kiran Rijiju, in a written reply to the Lok Sabha. He said that there would be a lot of huge savings on the public exchequer, but then there remain some challenges. These are bringing amendments to the five articles like Article 83, 80, 4, uh, 85, 172, 174 and mainly 356 to amend the constitution and having uh, ratification by half of the states. There is a need of consensus of all political
political parties and the state governments which would be, uh, which would be very essential with regard to India's federal uh, structure of governance and also they will need more additional EVMs, VVPATs, uh, cost would be huge, uh, they are uh, going on to, into thousands of crores along with additional polling personnel and also state forces as well. And the next, the, the final second one is NCRT being given a deemed university status. Now, what exactly is a deemed university? Now, deemed university is an institution of higher education that is recognized by the University Grants Commission under Section 3 of the University Grants Act of 1956. It is not established or incorporated by an act of the parliament or the state legislature, but is conferred the status by of a university by the central government on the recommendations of the UGC. A deemed university enjoys academic academic autonomy and also can design its own courses, its own syllabi, admission criteria, fee structure, faculty recruitment and also the examination system. De novo category, this is something which the NCRT got. So the NCRT has been granted the deemed university status under a de novo category which means that it has been recognized for the excellence in new and emerging areas of knowledge. De novo institution means an institution de devoted to innovations in teaching and research in a unique and emerging areas of knowledge such as biotechnology, nanotechnology, space science, etc. What are the benefits if an organization gets a deemed university status? Now, this can be launch of new courses, programs that are very relevant to the changing needs and demands of not only the education sector but also the market as well. They can collaborate with national and international universities and institutions of academic exchange, research projects, faculty development as well as student mobility. And the next most important issue is with regard to the steel frigate Mahendra Giri. Now, India's Navy warship Mahendra Giri has been developed by Maz uh, Mazgao Dock Shipbuilders Limited and it was recently launched by Draupadi Murmu, our very own president in Mumbai. Named after a mountain peak in Eastern Ghats in Odisha, Mahendra Giri, it is the seventh ship of Project 17A frigate series and boasts of enhanced steel features, advanced weapons, sensors, and also platforms management systems and they were giving a boost to the Indian Navy. The Nilgiri class 17A uh, this is also called as the Nilgiri class frigate formerly classified as 17A also called as Alpha frigates are a series of steel uh, guided missile frigates currently being uh, built by the Mazgao Dock Shipbuilders Limited and the Garden Reach Shipbuilders Engineers for the Indian Navy. The seventh and the final project of 17A frigate is the Mahindagiri. And the final one for the day is about National Mission for Clean Ganga. Now, the National Mission for Clean Ganga uh, is uh, or uh, the parent uh, is the organization which implements the Namami Gange program. It is an integrated conservation mission to protect and save uh, our river Ganga. It is a flagship program of the Union government since 2014 with an outlay of 20,000 crore rupees to accomplish twin objectives of effective abatement of pollution, conservation, and regeneration of the river Ganga. So, Namami Gange program is an integrated conservation mission approved under the flagship program by the Union Government uh, in 2014 to achieve twin objectives. It is being operated under the Department of Water Resources, River Development and Ganga Rejuvenation under the Ministry of Jal Shakti. The program is being implemented by the National Mission for Clean Ganga and its state counterpart organization that is a state program management groups along the 10 states uh, bordering the Ganga, River Ganga or in the Ganga Basin. The National Mission Cook Dean Ganga is being implemented, is the implementation wing of, uh, of National Ganga Council, which replaced the National Ganga River Basin Authority. And the main pillars of the program are sewerage treatment, infrastructure, industrial effluent, monitoring, riverfront development all along the states uh, bordering the Ganga, and biodiversity and afforestation, as well as public awareness. So, this brings me to the end of the session for the September current affairs for the upcoming preliminary examination and I shall see you in the next session with another list of your current affairs for the preliminary upcoming examination but yes beginning the series or uh, every weekly with our current affairs uh, I'm sorry polity and governance for the week and along with economy for the week beginning January 2024 so with this I shall see you very soon in my next post and uh, please do not forget to like share subscribe and don't forget to comment and I shall see you in my next post until then it's very happy learning